not be taking the stage. Have a great day, guys. Keep going. Um, ladies and gentlemen, every time. It's never. Well, there's a lot that's not funny. By the way, I want to thank everybody who followed the instructions yesterday oh boy. and put graphics on Stephen Norton's key lime shorts. Those were, those were some magic graphics out there, and I appreciate you. Rob appreciated being included. So, so much. I hear it was all tasteful too, which I appreciate. I do appreciate that. I wasn't, oh, yeah, even, wasn't even here. I still get thrown under the bus. But listen, you didn't get thrown under the bus because I, it's a lovely portrait of you. It's happened to be on Stephen Norton's crotch. It, uh, it was Adam Fergus who tried to make it dirty, and I don't think I don't think this classy crowd did what he asked. I don't. I think they kept it classy. Okay, that's good. So anyway, so no instructions needed. We're, no, we we're don't good. have to go through it again. No instructions to be given. Let's just move right on to the classy part of the program. Okay. Oops. I mean this part of the program. Ladies and gentlemen. You know him, you love him, and a good portion of you worship him. Misha Crowley. Is this social distancing? It's COVID. Yeah, you've been you've been around a bunch of people. He's a robot. He can't get a virus. No, the only virus he's, he can get was shut down his motherboard. It won't yeah. really affect anything else. Yeah. He has had COVID. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. He's riddled with COVID right now. Oh, Michael Borkvid, we call him. Um, here's a question for you. Yeah. How are you feeling? I'm feeling uh, fine. Is that fine. Okay? Yeah, yeah. The... <laughs> Burn that yeah. microphone. Uh, I, I think I probably shouldn't be making COVID jokes after having hugged uh, about uh, 150 people just now. So, sorry everybody who I hugged. I forgot to tell you. Um, I, 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 what? You're, you're good. I'm good. Worth it. Worth Got it. it. Got yeah. it. Worth it. Not worth it, actually. Uh, speaking as somebody who recently had COVID, not that much fun. I, I don't know what. Have you had it? No, I have not. Come here, you <laughs> big one. <blood. laughs> oh, you also had dogs the balls. No. Yeah. What the hell? You're, yeah. Get over yeah. there, you COVID lover. Uh, uh, and now he's got it a second time, everybody. Yeah. My poor, huh? Um, what was your, what was your COVID like? Uh, just tired, That's sleepy, it? yeah, sore throat. Yeah, I lost my taste. Oh. Yeah, I lost, I lost the taste too. That's why he's I, here. I read about, I read about it after, <laughs> what did you say? So that's why he's here. That's, is, that, that might be the first time that's ever happened. Someone makes a joke and then does their own drum set. No, I do. <laughs> no, it happens a lot, so I'm like, just in case you want to know, I am funny. <laughs> um, so I read about it, and the, the taste thing is because it's affecting the the uh, the olfactory uh, area of your brain. The virus gets into your brain, and people who ex who experience a loss of taste also experience like other emotional disturbances, which I had too. Really crazy. I was so anxious. And it was yeah. just like generalized anxiety. It wasn't like I'm nervous about something that I was shaking, like shaking. Rob, like, you my God, I've had COVID, COVID for years. <laughs> Rob, you might, you you might be patient zero. <laughs> Turns out I have had it. <laughs> and it still happened. Dating anyway. back to the early 70s. Oh, <laughs> I like the fact that as you're describing the symptoms, uh, the symptoms, Rob and I are both like lying to go like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> You are coming. <laughs> well, uh, we just we just did uh, a convention in Australia. Uh, when was that? Two weeks ago? No, no it was a last week ago. ago. And a lot of people had COVID at that convention. 
Luckily, not a lot of the actors have COVID now, except for most of them. Right. Yeah. Uh, I did test today, and uh, according to this flawed test, I don't have it, just to put you in this. I want to say, and Stephen Norton pointed this out, and I don't like to give him credit for pointing out things that or he's right about, but he was right about this. We're all taking the COVID test backstage before we, you know, we arrived at this convention. And it's all, it's all that same plastic thing. You put the drops on and you wait to see. And if there's a line at C, you don't have COVID. That seems like the wrong letter to put there. <laughs> like you, the line goes to C, you don't have COVID. But if it's C and T, you do have COVID. None, what nerd decided that they should like, look, C, which is COVID. Somebody loves Connecticut. <laughs> like we don't have COVID. It doesn't make any sense. And T, T, what, is T, what does the T stand for? Yeah, the T should be the that C line one, and the C should be the T line one. Right. Somebody was dyslexic in the in the factory when they were the, putting those the word together. The less dyslexic. And yeah, I know they <laughs> obviously did, no, no, they had the line in the wrong place. It's totally confusing. Well, I'm I, I feel like people. a strongly worded letter is in order here. Uh, here it comes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to fire that up right now. Bring me my quill pen. And the letter is C. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Collins. Brought to you by the letter C. Hello, friends. How are you? Good. Okay. I'm good. I just I, I'm good. I just had a good two week vacation with the kids. Um, we went to Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji, and Fiji was amazing, and so was New Zealand, and Australia was okay. And um, I have this tradition of slagging. Uh, is that the right word? Yeah. Uh, Australia on stage, and then late, later getting uh, emails from the convention organizers in Australia asking me to apologize publicly. So I want to keep that tradition up. Um, uh, yeah, th and then got, just got back. Uh, I actually landed last night uh, from Fiji at 12.30 a.m. So I'm a little bit jet lagged and I might just take a nap up here. But um, it was a little bit of culture shock coming back from like this, you know, very quiet, remote island in Fiji uh, to like the news in the U.S. It's like, my God. I should have stayed. <laughs> um, and, but it's nice to be here. This is. They often say that Orlando is the Fiji of the United States. So. We love you, Misha. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that non sequitur. And thank you for filling the awkward silence that I had left on stage here. It's like, somebody throw him a life ring. He's, he's flopping up there. Um, would anyone like to ask a question? How about you over there? You have a hole. You have several holes in your pants. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call that out in front of everybody. Is this on? It is on, yeah. So my name's Erin. Hi, Erin. Okay, but don't you put your name in the lottery? I do. Uh huh. So. Okay. Never mind. I, I, I have no further questions. Um, so I am a travel nurse. You're a travel nurse. Yes. Okay. So the current hospital that I'm at in Atlanta. Every morning we have a our shift home. And we have a running daily thing where we have to give a dad joke. So can you give me a joke to give all of the ladies? Okay. Um, it's funny, I just had a conversation about dad jokes with my, uh, my oldest friend who uh, is really, it's, a, it's actually a problem with him. <laughs> like the puns, the plays on words, the dad jokes, it's too much and it's not fun to be around. And, and he claims to have recently read a scientific paper about dad jokes and the fact that there is like a biological function for dad jokes, which is for the dad, the, the, the largest, potentially most threatening figure in a family unit, to let everyone know that he's not threatening. 
It's like, you're okay, I'm making a dad joke. And apparently, like, this paper somehow uncovered that there's some, like, biological uh, evidence for this. I don't know. I haven't read it. It's probably not true. <laughs> I just wanted to share that piece of hearsay nonsense. Um, hashtag fake news. So, um, uh, well, I, I, I don't know. I'm not really great at this, but I have one joke that I've told before on stage, so I feel bad for recycling it, but I'm gonna do it anyway, because it's one of my favorite jokes. It's a little, this one's a little dirty. So, sorry about that. If you have any nurse friends, you'll know we're very, very dirty. A dirty nurse? I think I've seen some of your movies. Only if you subscribe to my channel. <laughs> Okay, now I'm curious. <laughs> Seriously, what is your handle? Um, so I, um, uh, so guy uh, opens his front door and he sees a snail on the stoop and he picks it up, he throws it into the yard, and then two years later, he opens the door, sees a snail. Snail says, it's the same snail, by the way. He's got fucked up the joke. Same snail. Snail says, hey, what was that all about? <laughs> and I know what you're thinking right now. This guy is not threatening. <laughs> Remind me to look up Dirty Nurse Supernatural fan later. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's for you. Hi. Are you also a dirty nurse? Uh, no, but I do play one on TV. Okay. What's your name? Uh, Dana from Rhode Island. And Hi, Dana from Rhode Island. Yeah, Rhode Island. This is my first one. He's having a great time. I'm glad you are. So my question is, you did such a great job um, with all of the mannerisms with, uh, imitating Mark Pellegrino, could you explain your process for how you got into doing that? Sure. Um, I copied Mark Pell Pellegrino. That was my. That was the process. A little bit so more in depth. I mean, uh, I thought it was kind of a cool opportunity to play a character that had already been played by another actor, and actually really try to find the nuanced details. But. Um, I, and so I watched uh, several episodes where Mark had been Lucifer and tried to figure it, like tried to figure out how to mimic him, and uh, so I think that's where I got some. Like I, I tried to emulate his smile a little bit and a couple of other little ticks. But uh, it was the day before the first day of filming as Castiel playing Lucifer, and uh, I was like, I don't, I still feel like I don't really have this. So I went to Mark's apartment, he was in town at the time, and we went over the scenes that I was shooting the first day with his wife, Tracy, and um, they, I cheated. He gave me all of the tips, and one of them that I, that I used the most was, um, he said, every time I walk into a scene as Lucifer, I look at the other character in the scene, and I think, I either, and I try to decide, do I want to kill them, do I want to fuck them? And so that, that was sort of the, if you ever watch a, a me playing Lucifer on Supernatural, now you know what the subtext is in every scene. And it's funny because I've actually carried that forward in the rest of my life. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So it's on his Kicking the microphone over, you're welcome. I'm Mandy. Um, Mandy, and she's angry. <laughs> What is your favorite mistake you've ever made? Uh, I wish I could say that my kids were accidents, but they weren't. Um, Damn. Favorite mistake? God, that's a really good question. I don't have an answer for you because I never make mistakes. Okay, here's, I, here's one, here's one. I, 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 no, don't walk away. 
just because I'm wasting everyone's time. Um, okay, so I was a young actor, believe it or not, at one point, and um, I had been cast. Is this my first? It was it was my second role, uh, but it was my first role that had any significant dialogue in it, and it was in a big movie. It was Girl Interrupted, and for for an actor who had like really never done anything at that point, um, I had done an industrial for the Navy and uh, an, uh, an instructional video for the IRS. Will there be a sequel to that? I, I yes. Uh, tax Evasion by Misha Collins. Um, and um, so this was like a, like a, a totally another league. And I had this scene where I was at a party uh, and I was hitting on Winona Ryder. And it was like a long, like a long like lengthy chunk of dialogue between the two of us. That was my, like, my, my role. And I got there um, and I, they, they cut my hair to look, it was a period piece, so I, I think it was 1970s. So they cut my hair to look like 1970s and they gave me this like cool, like, like leather vest with all of these like straps that had to tie together and I, I couldn't figure out how to put it on so I went into the makeup trailer and uh, one of the girls in the makeup trailer I was like I'm, I'm, I'm like tangled up in this thing and I can't figure it out can you help me put this on and she was like sure and so she like it took about 10 minutes to untangle me and put it on but she finally got it fixed and then later I found out that, that was Angelina Jolie <laughs> Which was cool. <laughs> Hi. Hi, uh, uh, my name is Emma. Hi, Emma. And my question is in regards to your um, poetry book. Yes. It is, um, what is like your favorite or like most significant to you? Like what's your favorite poem? And like, could you like give us some insight on how like it came about? Uh, two poems come to mind as like, uh, I don't know, maybe more. There are a few, there are a few poems in there that are really um, meaningful to me. I think one is called Control Center, which is about divorce, which is not a super uh, happy subject. One is called uh, uh, Present Tense, which is about um, a, an incident that happened with my kids and about like just how kids can help remind you to stay in the moment and what a precious thing that is. And that's an, like, kind of an important poem to me. Um, and then there's a poem in there that's <clears throat> honestly kind of about the same thing, which is called The Last Poem. And I named it that because I'm clever. <laughs> and it's the last poem in the book. Uh, I was like, oh, what should I call this poem? This last poem in the book. I don't know. The publisher's like, listen, we need the book. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is the last poem. Um, but it's, a, it's also, a, it's a poem about lasts. Like the last, this is something that has always um, been like an emotional trigger for me somehow. Um, the last time you, the last time you do something in your life um, is often something that you don't, recognize in the moment that it's going to be the last like the last time you know I, in, in this poem it's sort of reflecting on all of the lasts that happened in childhood um for, from a parent's perspective like the last time you're you the last time you carry your kid on your shoulders i might be able to carry my son on my shoulders a few more times but it's getting like my back is not liking it anymore and there will be a time when it's the last time i carry him on my shoulders and I likely won't know that it's the last. Um, and for me, that's like this interesting, just emotional thing where it, there's a part of my brain that's kind of vigilant about, is this moment the last? And it's also a constant reminder to appreciate the things that you're doing at the moment because you never know what's gonna be the last time you do something in life. Um, so that poem is, I think, probably potentially the most meaningful to me. Hi. Hi, здравствуйте. Здравствуйте. 
Yeah, um, my name is Irina. I, um, Twitter said there are 45 questions I write for other people and none of them are ones that I want to ask you. Sweet. <laughs> so I'm going to give you an option, um, truth or dare, and I will give you the dare up front. Okay. Oh, well, that's really great. Thank you. Because that's always such a fucking risk, you know? Like, I don't want to get up here and then not take my pants down, but I said yes to the dare, so that's not cool. This is a PG rated. Okay. Um, so, um, last convention in Chicago, I believe Rich mentioned that you know how to do the Russian Cossack dance. That's actually my party trick. Okay. So I would dare you to do that. Okay. Because I could out dance you. Okay. Uh, or I ask you a question of my choice. Okay, well, I, Rich is a pathological liar, <laughs> and I can't do that, and I would break myself and the stage if I tried. I would like to see you do it. Can you really do it? Yeah. Yes? And you're also wearing a relatively short dress, so this could be this super interesting. Oh, damn. <laughs> But, uh, but then I will take your uh, question because that's fair. Okay. No! On stage! If it's not a romper, you're in for a treat. It is. <laughs> you're an attorney? Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay. Thanks. What's up? Uh, the only thing I can think of is, uh... Russian lyrics that I could think of. <laughs> nice work. Excellent performance. Vaguely confirm it? Um, no, I think I can confirm it. I mean, I, you know what? I keep getting in trouble, by the way, with the uh, network for saying things that I'm not supposed to say. Um, but... Have they announced that? Blame it on jet lag. Where, where, where did you get to hear this rumor? Just the internet. Vlogs? There was a thing? What weekly? It was already, as you know, in production weekly. Which I read weekly. So I'm just parroting what production weekly said. Uh, but it is going to be filming in Atlanta, which is in the United States. And... Um, and we're going to be, uh, we, we were going to be filming, I think the original plan was to film in Toronto, um, but for a host of reasons, it ended up being better to film in Atlanta, um, which is going to be a lot easier for everybody. So, filming in Atlanta, production is officially ramping up in two, uh, like the production office is open in two weeks, but I, I think the plan is not to start filming until September. And I, I believe... Our, our air date is going to be in January. You live in Atlanta? I do, yeah. Oh, Me great. and my son Lucas, actually, that asked me to drive there like two years ago on a Zoom. No way. Yeah. Well, awesome. So we'll see you there. What kind of attorney do you do? I'm, I'm a divorce attorney. Oh. <laughs> well, um, that sounds fun. Um, <laughs> Cool. Hi. Hi. My name's Charlotte. Uh, I also did not expect to get picked because nothing good ever happens to me. Oh no, Charlotte. That's, that's horrible. Don't worry about it. Um, 
Yeah, but now, like, it's just actually another shitty thing, because you got up to the front of the line and you don't know what to ask, and you basically pop with your pants down, not to refrain something that I seem to be obsessed about right now, but... Um, I, Charlotte, I'm glad that you're here, and I think that this marks a turning point in your life. From this point forward, it will be all good things. Thank you. Yes. Oh, a... No pictures, please. Um, so I uh, didn't have a question, so I literally typed in questions to ask celebrities. <laughs> you know, there were lots of people that had really pressing questions that I really wanted to ask. Well, but how about I Really good. Okay, great. So, um, let's see. What's <laughs> what ridiculous thing has someone tricked you into doing or believing? See, it's good. That is good. Thank you. It's a lot better. You know what? The rest of you should Google next time. These are good questions. Um, ridiculous thing has someone tricked me into believing. Snipe hunting? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of some of the more ridiculous things that I believed as a child. Um, I was an older brother, so of course I was mostly the one that doing the tricking. Um, I, uh, this, I, had, I recently had an experience with my daughter, speaking of tricking. Um, my, I, I, my, my daughter on this trip just now, she, did, she asked me to do a magic trick. And uh, I did a magic trick. I, I don't normally brag about this, but I'm, I'm possessed of the skill of magic. I, I have ma the force of magic that flows through me. And I do magic tricks sometimes when I, when I feel it or when that, when that force wells up so much that I have to release it. <laughs> um, so, I did a magic trick. It was astonishing. I, I had one coin and I turned it into another coin of a different currency, which is almost impossible to do if you're not at a currency exchange place. <laughs> and my daughter uh, said, okay, Dad, now tell me trick how do you do it and she's nine now going on ten and uh and so i was just like well and I, I started to tell her about you know the the what you do is you do something with your other hand that distracts the eye right so i said you do something with your other hand and she said that cut me she cut me off mercifully she said once you have the power of magic do you ever lose it and I was like, oh, oh, yes, magic is still real. It's so good. It really works. And no, you never lose it because she knows that she has the power of magic as well. Because I've, I, I've been with her when something has appeared in her ear that wasn't there before. Um, but it's, a, it's just sort of lovely to have these moments of recognition where like, oh, right. You're still in childhood. Sometimes I talk to my kids like they're grown-ups. Um, grown-ups that, that I'm in a fight with, actually. <laughs> um, and it's really nice to have reminders that they're still children, you know? So thank you. I didn't answer your question, but I got, it was so tangentially related. Hi. Oh, I'm so sorry. Really gonna make her bad. Okay. Um, well, um, yes. So you, is she okay? Yeah, she's you know no symptoms, but positive. So. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm sorry. I know, but okay. But enough about her. Who cares? <laughs> um, I just wanted to say I love John ER. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Total classic. She says she wants to know what is the most unexpected thing someone has done for Gish. Yay. Yay, Gish. Uh, uh, unexpected thing that someone has done to Gish. I don't know, but I, it's just, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm probably not going to answer the, your question either. But um, 
when I was in Australia just now, I met uh, I met a fan who said, I just want to tell you that uh, one of the items that we did for GISH a few years ago was to have people register to be a bone marrow donor. And you have to, like, give, I guess you have to get a little blood sample or something, and then they can, like, it, it, they see if your, your DNA matches, and then a few thousand people, like, signed up to be bone marrow donors. But it's very rare to actually find a match, um, so most of those people will never have it. Anyway, this woman said, I ended up being a match for somebody, and I ended up being a bone marrow donor. And I was like, oh my God, that's so amazing. It's like, what a great, generous, she was so, um, she was so gracious about it. And so like not looking for praise, it was really sweet. But then she was like, yes, it was quite painful. I, I said, isn't it like super painful? She's like, yeah, it was pretty painful. Um, and then, you know, whatever. I, I ended up getting a, a, a blood infection from the procedure and I was hospitalized and I, I took about six months to recover. But, but anyway, she was like, <laughs> But anyway, it was, you know, I was just glad to have been able to do it. She started with thanking me. And I was like, ugh. Um, so in Gish, early on in Gish, I, I, have a, I have a really cavalier attitude sometimes. And I think my attitude can, I, my friends call me a pathological optimist. And my, I am like, I'll take, you know, I'll go for a run with friends. And if I'm leading a run, typically we end up like, scaling barbed wire fences or like stuck in brambles somewhere and everyone's like ah why did we follow misha again and that's sort of typically how things unfold that's that's basically a metaphor for my larger life and uh and early on with gish i i did things that without thinking through the consequences um and there was a there was an event probably eight years ago in Seattle, it was one like the hottest summer day in Seattle in a long time, and I missed my ferry coming over from the San Juan Islands to the mainland, so I was an hour and a half late, and there were 900 people dressed as French maids <laughs> in, a, in an unair-conditioned gymnasium waiting for me, and they were like shoulder to shoulder, and I got there. We did. We, we broke a Guinness World Record of the largest number of Guinness, uh, largest number of uh, French maids in one place. And then, and then everyone was like, kind of like dying. And, and I was like, well, let's go outside and try to break another Guinness World Record. So everybody goes outside in their black dresses in the sun, and we tried to form the largest human chain and pass a hula hoop around the chain. That was another Guinness World Record. And during the process of breaking that. Uh, other world record, we ended up breaking three that day, but as we were breaking that, that Hulu world record, uh, seven ambulances came <laughs> for people who were passing out from heat exhaustion. <laughs> that was my fault. <laughs> I felt horrible about that, and I vowed to change my ways. <laughs> Which I do, I do make an effort on. Yeah. Difference in everybody's life, so good job. Thanks for your kindness. And I'm sorry to those people. Again, I've said sorry to you many times, but I'm still sorry. Okay, hi. Hi, I'm Austin. Hi, Austin. Love you, by the way. Oh. Absolutely love you. Oh. I guess. I think I love you too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Made my day. My question for you would be out of all the monsters in Supernatural, which one do you think you could take in real life? <laughs> Without your angel powers. Without my angel powers? Yes. Probably the Antichrist. <laughs> I think he was only seven. Okay. I think I could take that kid. If he doesn't turn me into an action figure first. <laughs> What about you? Who would you go after? Vampire. Oh yeah, vampire. I mean, vampire, they do seem kind of fragile in Supernatural, don't they? Cut I mean, their head yeah, off. Just cut her, well, just, just cut their head off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's so easy, you know? How often do you cut people's heads off? Once a month. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody watch him. Um, hi. 
Hi, Misha. I'm Summer. Hi, Summer. I'm trying to ask you this question since 2017, so I'm really excited. Oh, my God. Uh, that was like early Trump administration. <laughs> uh, um, yes. What's your question? So at Autographs, I had mentioned that you had sort of been a surrogate father for me growing up, and then you mentioned that you also had surrogate fathers when you were growing up, and Supernatural is about you don't have to be blood to be family. And you, your character Castiel, sort of posed as a character, as a father figure to Jack. So I was wondering what that was like for you as someone who's grown up with um, family that isn't blood and is playing one on TV. That's a good question. Did you Google that? <laughs> Immediately after autographs, I was like, I need to ask him this. <clears throat> um, well, who, who was your surrogate father? Uh, my stepfather. He, he stepped in whenever my dad wasn't there, so. Um, it, it, uh, you know, I, yeah. I, I want to say I, 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 I always had a, a real father, um, but I only saw him every other weekend for most of my childhood. Um, and those were relatively short weekends too. So we did, I didn't have a ton of time with him and he wasn't like a, he wasn't like a constant presence in my life. Um, and we're actually, he and I are, closer now, I would say, than we've ever been previously, which is really nice. Um, but <clears throat> I did have a couple of adult male role models. One, uh, one really showed up only in my life very briefly. Uh, he was my mom's boyfriend for a little while, but then after they broke up, he like taught me how to fix cars, and I would go into his shop. Me and, too, like, work. that as well? Yeah, it was just like a really cool thing uh, to ha he pierced my ear, uh, and uh, and it was just it was like it was just cool to like have somebody around who was a steady presence who was who I could just like soak up practical things from. And there was another man who I met. His name was Mr. Hygus. I was I think I was ten, and I had I had a couple of paper rounds, and on, I was collecting money because this guy hadn't paid. His, for the week of uh, with the dollar twenty five for the owed for the week of papers, and knocking on the door, and this guy came to the door, and he saw me with my brother tagging along with me, and started asking us questions, and quickly ascertained that our father wasn't around, and he was in his seventies at the time, and had uh, had run a, a workshop for fatherless boys back in the sixties, and then had 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 his own kids and his own family, and his life got too busy, and he stopped doing that. So he went inside, and he told me this later, he went inside and talked to his wife and was like, I think I have to, I think I have to start it up again for those two boys. It just seemed like the right thing to do. And he was amazing for us. For, for several years, we would spend so much time with him. He taught us about electric circuits, and we made these like balsa wood boats, and he taught us Chinese, and he would, we were very poor at the time. In fact, we were, I think at the, that time, homeless, and he would take us out to the fanciest restaurants, which, you know, by my standards now, were like really shitholes. But it seemed so extravagant. And he would always take us out to lunch at these nice restaurants. And, uh, and he was just so kind for no reason to these two stranger kids that showed up on his doorstep. And that made a huge difference in my life. And I think about him often. I went, we went, uh, when I was maybe, 14, we went to drop off Christmas presents for him, and his wife was like, oh, I'm sorry you didn't hear, Mr. Hygus has passed away. And I just broke down sobbing, I remember that. Um, just got myself again. Um, but, you know, there were a few people like that in my, in my, in my early life. Sorry, I'm super jet lagged, so I'm a little um, more vulnerable than usual. Um, there were a few people in my early life who did things like that, who just, you know, I, I think it was like partly lucky for our family that we were in a position of need. So people would extend these kindnesses to us because they saw that we you know, didn't have any money or needed a place to stay or whatever. But that really helped me see the value of that kind of kindness, not necessarily to strangers, but like reaching out a little bit to help people who you see need something, um, it just stuck with me. It was like, I, I, think, I think a lot of times we forget how important those things can be to people. I had a, 
um, I, I don't know why I'm so savvy, but there, there was a guy that came and worked on um, my house back in 2001 when we were like doing this, basically building a house. And he was from El Salvador and didn't speak a word of English. And he was, uh, he was in his 50s and didn't know anything about construction. And it was clear after the first day working with him that he was a total disaster. Like, I had to redo everything that he did. But it was also clear that he had no place to live, he had no money, he had a family back home that he was trying to support. So Carlos ended up staying in our like ramshackle, uh, dilapidated remodel for about six months with us. He was like sleeping in the crawl space under the house while we were sleeping in the carport. It was, it was a mess. But every Thanksgiving and Easter, we would invite him over for, to join the family for dinner for a few years. And about 15 years later, um, I stopped by to say hi to him. And he brought us into the apartment where he stays on the couch, looking at this little one bedroom apartment. He found a woman who would rent him the couch. And he said, uh, we had tea up there, and he said, oh, you want to see my photos? And I said, sure. And he took out this photo album, and it was all photos of us. And it was like, it had been nothing to us. Like, we'd done nothing for this guy, but it was clearly so important to him. And it was, that was like another reminder to me, like, right. It takes so little to make such a big difference because we had ultimately been like his surrogate family in America without even realizing that's what was happening. Um, so I think these things are important. I mean, ultimately, I think that was a big part of why, um, of like a big part of the motivation between behind starting Random Acts for me. It was like we can we can all do we can all do little things, and it makes a huge effect on people in the long run. Anyway, I'm being super sentimental. I don't know why. Hi. Hi, Misha. My name's Alyssa. Um, you have shared so much of yourself with us at all these conventions, and we thank you, and we're grateful. What's one question you've always wanted to be asked, and what's your answer? <laughs> Not that question. <laughs> the nice thing about getting up here is at least I don't have to ask the questions, you know? Um, do you want me to Google something real quick? Yeah. <laughs> wanna, wanna, what, what is a question that you have? What is an actual question that you want to know? Um, it's got to see. What it's, yeah, I know, right? Um, what has been the most challenging uh, acting experience that you've had? Um, <laughs> probably, uh, I would say probably working with <laughs> we had, um, I can't, I, I, I cannot quantify how challenging it was. Um, and it, it, <laughs> it, be, it was a sport for him. Did you know that killer whales um, they, when they're like chasing down baby seals, they'll knock them into the air while they're still alive, like bat them into the air like a bean bag, and then they hit the water and then bat them in the air again, and they play with their prey until, until they ultimately eviscerate and kill them. That's what it was like working with Jared. Um, for the first several years, it was it was particularly bad, like going into a scene. Which you know what was the worst also was when Jensen was in the scene, because then Jared would be like, "Well, watch this, friend. Watch me fuck with him." Um, he had an audience, and then it just it was it, so. Whenever I <laughs> I remember this, I for, I had forgotten this. When I read scripts, I was like, "Ah, oh, shit, the Jared and Jensen scene. <sighs> That's gonna take forever." And Jim Beaver, so, so Jared would just, just, can I say this? He would fuck with you. Um, so when it was your coverage, when the cameras were on your face and not on him, he would do anything in his power to make you laugh. And at first I would try to not laugh. So in the beginning I would be like, 
I, I tried, I, I literally bit my cheeks. It's like, if I bite my cheeks and it hurts bad enough, maybe I can think about that pain instead. So of course, like, as I'm establishing the character of Castiel, there are a lot of scenes where he's just like, And uh, and then as time wore on, I realized, oh, and I would watch Jim Beaver, and Jim Beaver was a machine. It was amazing. I mean, the man is a robot, and nothing Jared could do would ever make Jim Beaver laugh. And I was like, I want to be like Jim. How, how can I do that? And then I, after about another year, I just stopped trying. I was like, I can never do that. I will never be able to do that. So I would just laugh, and I would... I have this capacity for patience, and I would just wear Jared out. Eventually, he would want to go home and go to sleep. And I knew that, or he would be too hungry to keep doing what he was doing. And I would bank on that, and eventually he would stop. Or, here's, here's another good for instance. Um, we, were, we were filming a scene, I can't remember, uh, it was in a cabin, Ben Edlin was directing, I don't remember what episode, but. Um, we were filming a scene, Jared and Jensen were in the scene, and they were relentlessly, both of them, fucking with me. And it was like, ridiculous. It was never, oh, it was a scene where I yelled, watch your eyes. And my, my voice had cracked. And then every time I would say my dialogue, they would go, watch your eyes. <laughs> like in Scooby-Doo. <laughs> And they wouldn't stop. They wouldn't stop. And finally, I was like, get off the stage. And the first AD and the director were like, yeah, boys, out. And Jared and Jensen left the stage. And they were walking back, Jared told me this later, they were walking back to their trailers. And Jared was like, wait a minute, what just happened? We just got kicked off the stage of our own show. How did that happen? And then we proceeded to film the scene without them because we had gotten their coverage in the scene already. It was all just, all, all that we still had to do was mine. And there were uh, the script supervisor and Robin Props were playing Jared and Jensen. And Robin needed to be taller so that my eye line would be higher. So she was standing on a chair <laughs> reading Jared's lines, and unfortunately, the sight of the two of them playing Jared and Jensen also made me laugh. Yeah, so that was challenging. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. 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 How's it going? I'm good. I'm Izzy. Hi. I'm Hi. You're Izzy? What? What's your name? Did you say you're Dizzy? No, I'm Izzy. Izzy. But I guess that too. Hi, Izzy. Hi. Um, I have a question, of course. Great. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in this line. That's not true. A lot of people in the line don't have questions, as it turns out. It is not a prerequisite for being in the line. That could be something in the future creation you could say, like, it's not just sign up to ask a question, but maybe it should say, if you have a question, you may sign up. Anyway. Yes. I, I was just wondering, because I think it's an interesting topic, what's the strangest or funniest or weirdest dream you've ever had? <laughs> None of your business. With the sexy nurse. <laughs> um, I, I had a dream, <clears throat> I had a dream, speaking of childhood earlier, I had a dream uh, we used to live on, when I was like six, we lived on a river, and we had a dog named Bear Dog, uh, who we had until I was like 14. And Bear uh, loved fetching sticks, and he loved fetching sticks from the water. So we'd throw sticks into the river, and then he would go out and come back in. And one day, uh, I was throwing a stick into the river, and Bear Dog jumped into the river, went out, swam, went under, and then came back up as a gigantic, Bear was black, uh, gigantic black feathered big bird came out of the river as a gigantic black big bird and it scared the shit out of me. And the next day, uh, my mother said, go feed bear. And I had to go downstairs to feed bear. And I was like, I'm not gonna do that. I don't wanna do that. Somebody else feed bear. 
I don't know when he's gonna, if he's still Big Bird or if he's gonna turn back into Big Bird. I told everybody in school what happened. Some of them were incredulous, but I was like, no, it really happened. And I was, I was, I was eight or nine when uh, someone like mentioned Sesame Street, and I was like, you know what happened? <laughs> and then it suddenly dawned on me, dude, that was a dream. And for ye literally for like three years of my childhood, I had just thought that that was a real true fact that had happened and was telling everybody about it and subsequently had no friends. <laughs> and I, I remember that like light bulb moment. I'm like, oh, this makes much more sense. <laughs> so that was a weird dream. That's very G rated yeah. as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Nisha. My name's Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Um, I love you, number one. You're amazing. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so Supernatural went on for, obviously, 15 years. Too long. Uh, <laughs> not long enough for some of us. Um, it's uh, very diverse, and very, you guys play very different characters throughout the entire show. Um, I think especially for you, you play so many different versions of Cass. Um, for example, and not limited to... I noticed how you corrected yourself when you said it's very diverse. You're like, it's very diverse. You all, you play different versions of yourselves. <laughs> um, so, uh, especially for you, uh, for example, but not limited to uh, Lucifer Cass, Leviathan God Cass, Hippie Cass, <laughs> um, so, many, so many different versions, uh, Human Cass, Regular Cass. Uh, which one was your favorite or the most fun to prepare for and play, and why? Um, I, I do a fair amount of like method acting, so I try to like experience the things as much as possible. So with Hippie Cast, I did a lot of just getting ready for the role. <laughs> um, I, had a lot, I had a lot of like seven-on-one orgies. And that was cool, because it really helped me get into the character. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, Shai. Hi. Hi, Shai. I have a message from a lot of people. They want to know that you're very loved. Oh, thank you very much. And um, a few years ago, you did a paternity test with Alex. But we never heard the results. So we'd like to know the results of those. So the reason that we didn't talk about it publicly, um, uh, I hope he's okay with me saying this. Um, the, the paternity test came back negative, so I'm actually not his father. But uh, the DNA sampling also showed that he's not human. <laughs> And his agent didn't want us to talk about that. Yeah. I like this lightning round. Yes, hi, Jennifer. Um, so I'm really looking forward to your villain era as Harvey Dent. So my question is, do you have a favorite villain? And if so, who? God, I hate to recycle things, but I'd have to say Jared Padalecki. <laughs> Um, he is, of course, the face of evil, but he's also just so lovable, and it's hard to reconcile those two qualities in him. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Nisha. I'm Ange. Hi, Ange. My question is about Mason. Yes. You frequently post on Twitter these amazing things that come out of her mouth, these things she says, and occasionally Wes, too, but mostly Mason. And every time you do, I tweet back at you saying, please publish a book of Masonisms, because they're so brilliant. Um, a fan did that. A fan put together a book, like, and, and bound it for me. Um, and it was just all of the things that I had posted that Mason had said uh, in a book. And seeing them all together, I was like, well, this is fantastic. And then unfortunately, I left it out, and Mason found it. I was like, Dad, <laughs> these were private statements. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, she does have such a lovely mind. Uh, they both do. Um, West manifests in a different way. He doesn't. Um, he, he, he doesn't have these like little. Uh, well, actually, recently he's been coming up with. His new favorite thing is to come up with new, new twists on old expressions, and he he actually wants to write a book about that. So we'll see, because some of them are pretty disturbing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I heard. Oh, okay. Hey. Um, my question is, I um, suffer from major depressive disorder. So my question is, do you have a mantra or something that you do, if it's too personal, that's okay, um, that helps you when the world feels too big? Or are I, you immune to that now? <laughs> um, no, I'm certainly not immune. Um, I I have struggled with different things, like a, uh, some some depression in, in my life. Um, I if for me, depression usually shows up in relatively short periods of time, uh, like two or three weeks, um, and it happens historically for me like once every couple of years. Um, I actually wrote about that in my book of poetry a little bit, but. Um, but for me, I have like a window into what depression feels like because I have, I, I experience these chapters. I call it bolting for myself because it feels like I'm shedding something and I, I'm, I'm almost like paralyzed by, by depression when it happens, like stay in bed. Um, it's, not, it's not a happy place, but I always, it always only lasts like a couple of weeks for me and knowing that really helps. Like if, 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 if that was like gonna go on forever, it would be really challenging. Um, but one thing, and, and then anxiety shows up for me um, from more, more frequently. And I, <clears throat> um, I, find I, I have like very um, unsophisticated tools that really help. One is exercise. When I exercise a lot and I'm feeling healthy, I do a lot better. And meditation, and I meditate every day, and uh, and that's pretty important. And I can feel the qualitative difference in my days when I when I miss a meditation. It's not it's not good for me. Um, but I do I do something called mindfulness meditation, which is basically paying attention to the body sensations. And one of the great benefits of that is that when all, every emotion has a physical manifestation. So like, for example, anxiety shows up as like, for me, slightly like almost nauseous feeling in the stomach and a tightness there. And, and it can be like a flush on the cheeks and like a jitteriness. But with, with, when you're paying attention to body sensations and meditation, it makes it so you can feel those things and know like, oh, I am feeling the sensations of anxiety or feeling the sensations of sadness. And those, and, and having that awareness that there's this physical manifestation sometimes helps break the, the story loop that makes it worse, that makes, that compounds the, the suffering. So for me, those two tools are the things. I'm, I'm not a psychologist, and there are lots of other tools in the toolbox, but those are the things that I use. I understand, thank you. Thank you. So, Hi. so a couple years ago when you guys were shooting season 15, um, I was in Vancouver and got to be um, on set when you were shooting outside. Oh! Hi! Hi. Um, and uh, while we were uh, waiting, while you guys were off filming, um, you appeared to go missing. Uh, the PAs were looking for you for about 20 minutes and came down and asked us if we had seen you and who you were. And I was just wondering, how often did you pull a vanishing act and report the There are people on set whose jobs it is to, to wrangle the actors. Actors, so one of the worst things about working in film and television is that you have to work with actors. And they, uh, if an actor, for example, you know, decides, you know what, I'm not coming out of my trailer, I want to finish watching the baseball game, that ha and that happens, 
for a, an, an entire crew of 130 people will have to wait and the production is paying overtime for those people. Like tens of thousands of dollars it can cost if an actor doesn't come out of the room. So it's worth it for production to, to hire people whose whole job, their only job, is to get the actor from their trailer to the set. And in fact, on Supernatural, we had somebody whose job it was to get us out of the trailer and to the door of the stage, and then someone else's job to get us from the door of the stage on to the set where the cameras were. Two people, full time, sometimes 14 hours a day, and, that, and that's just to get us, they could have been, like if we were responsible adult humans, they could be like texting us like, hey Mish, we need you on set right now, and two people would be out of work. But because we have, it's because I'm so generous <laughs> that I would occasionally wander off because I wanted to provide these people with job security. <laughs> if production suddenly got the feeling like, oh, these guys will show up without somebody grabbing them by the hand and pulling them into the stages, then people would lose their jobs and then they, their families and their kids would go hungry and I don't want to be responsible for that. So occasionally, while we were filming, I would go to a restaurant nearby. Or go for a job. Or something like that. Because I care about the crew. Yeah, I know. Hi. So in that line, uh, several years ago, you, Jared and Fenton, did a photo shoot where quite a lot of champagne ended up all over you. <laughs> On a scale from one to influence, how sticky was that? <laughs> There's so many times when we have done things, like they used to ply us with drinks at these sh photo shoots because they knew that they would get us to do stupider things. And I think the champagne is a good example of that. But there's so many times when I have looked at the, the like magazine after a photo shoot and been like, oh my God, did we really do that? Was I really dumping a half gallon of milk on my face with cat ears on? In what universe was that a good idea to do for a national magazine, Misha? And Jared and Jensen were also, also fell victim to the same uh, mentality and witnessed us spraying each other in the face like we did um, that day. So um, yeah, I would say I would give it a four though. Champagne is actually not nearly as bad as it could be. Thank you. Yeah. Take another question, I mean, why not? Go ahead. Why not? Do it. Yeah, all right. This is the last question. Really? Yeah. Amazed. Last question. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> First of all, I'm Heather. I'm from here in Orlando. And, Hi, Heather. Um, I have a crowdsourced question from a group. I'm on a, whoops, I'm on a fanfic readers and writers group. Okay. And they were answering around uh, questions and dared me to ask this question. Okay. So, be forewarned. So as I'm sure that you know, um, I'm, I'm, nervous. I'm sure that you know, there are many fan fictions that describe your, I mean, Castiel's lips in great detail. Noting that they are I'm sure you're aware. <laughs> yes, I read those to my children as bedtime stories, <laughs> as I'm sure you're aware. Yes. Describe your what in great detail? My lips. As I'm sure you're aware is not the way to open that sentence. My chap lips. As I'm sure you're aware. Wait a minute, your chap lips or your chap's lips? Like, do you have a, a, a sort of a man boy handler who's you call a chap? I, my chap's lips? Yeah, you go chap. There's so many weird things that that could be. He also, That's like, you know, the Misha like often wears labia. when he's relaxing. I don't want to overspeak, but because I stay in my house, I know this. He likes to lounge around or you know pretend he's riding a horse in assless chaps. So he has those. You mean there? Like the leather needs to be more supple? I mean, what do we, where are we going with this? Like chapstick needing chopped lips. Oh. Oh. Oh, 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 okay. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we're being silly. No. <laughs> there we go. Um, and of course, my question went away. Hold on. Here it is. And I was just wondering, 
Could you please, for my group, prove to me personally whether they are really chopped or not? <laughs> um, I just realized I, I felt like Jensen just then. It's like Jensen posing in a photo shoot. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I just started watching Supernatural with my kids because they're finally like old enough that they aren't going to be... We're in the same I was going to say they're not going to be traumatized, but that's not true. They will be, but it's okay. They need it at this point. Um, and I had no idea my lips were so chapped, but uh, it, it turns out I, the question. I okay. should have used chapstick back in the I guess, day. Do, you, yeah. do you know this? Like, and she says, are you sure you're aware? No. Were I you wasn't. aware? Certainly not. So right now, like... <laughs> It's, it's always my favorite thing when you open a question, like, as I'm sure you're aware, the well, internet hates I, you. I am, I, am, I am very much aware of the fact that people who read and write fanfic and slash fic, uh, they all believe fervently that I am the author of most of the material. Right. <laughs> so people are like, we know you read it, Misha. We know that this is how, this is how you rock yourself to sleep. We know you cry yourself to sleep over this stuff, and um, and, and you do, you don't. I claim to not. Okay, right. yes. claim to not. Right. I remember when I first got on Supernatural, and I was looking. Uh, I, I I was like a guest star, and I was like, I knew that the that Eric was like toying with the idea of maybe bringing me back for like another couple of episodes, and I was looking online. Uh, God, I can't even remember the name of the website. It was like this was before Twitter, like. Live journal. I was looking at a live journal where after every episode there were like these volumes of fan reviews and I was reading and somehow like clicked through to a link to some story and it was like about Cass and Dean. And and it's hard and I was like, I don't this like this didn't happen. And and then I was like, well, maybe somebody got a hold of a, of a con. I was reading it, and I was like, maybe somebody got a hold of one of the scripts that are coming on the pipe. And then I was like, oh, then, you know, and Cass's, like, lips lock with Dean's. And then he slowly, like, starts kissing down his torso. And I was like, this seems like a spinoff or something. Like, I'm not sure what show this is. And literally, that's the only fan fiction I've ever read, but the fans are like, nope, we know the truth. We know. Let me ask you this, in the what? scenario that you read, were your lips chapped? You know what I mean? That's the question on the table. Thank you. There we go! Here we go. Chap off to the chapel. Well, it really chaps, chaps me when people. <laughs> when chaps my high when people chaps. Me. Um, Robbie, a couple things going on before we announce the next thing going on. So listen. Okay. The day is 30 minutes behind. Oh. Except for the concert. Everything else is going to be 30 minutes delayed. It's all moving 30 minutes because Jared and Jensen are having toupee issues. Okay. It's not about the wax melting and the humidity down here in Florida. And it's sliding to the left, sliding to the right. I don't even know if they can stick it on the scalp at all. they got to figure wow. out something. I saw them rushing into Jared's room with about four Sharpies. I think they're just going to draw it on. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but they got to they gotta do that. That's going to take a good half hour. Okay. And then everything will, will resume. But the concert stays right where it belongs. Good. No so worries. you're saying we have a half an hour less to eat dinner. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Got it. But meantime, some parts of this program are fun and relaxing and no one gets hurt. Other parts are incredibly, incredibly dangerous, like this next event.